Let's begin with a word of prayer, orienting ourselves to our study tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, last night we saw in the book of Revelation how it is not only a revealing of Jesus Christ, but it is also a revealing of ourselves, who and what we are in Christ. What a phenomenal concept when we realize that the unveiling of Christ is the unveiling of us, who we are in Him, and that is the way that we can live each day of our lives. And yet, Heavenly Father, so many Christians today are plagued by stress, anxiety, and depression in their life, all kinds of circumstances and reasons. Pray, Father, that this study will open the eyes to some and lead them to how you have resolved this great problem. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Going to start to uh, tonight's class, tonight's study, in reading this part of Newsweek. This is the October the 7th edition of Newsweek. I was in the airport in Tucson, Arizona, and the cover caught my attention. And I just waited till tonight to just read part of this. The front page that caught my attention <clears throat> says that three million kids suffer from stress and depression. What you can do. The title of the whole article is Teen Depression. Can you turn it up just a little bit, please? <clears throat> Um, inside, <clears throat> young and depressed. Ten years ago, this disease, this, this disease, they call depression the disease, and therefore if it's a disease, then it can be cured and should be cured by drugs. And that's the way they want to handle it, like alcoholism, homosexuality, and a lot of Christians are buying into all of this stuff. But let's not get involved in that right now. Ten years ago, this disease was for adults only. But as teen depression comes out of the closet, it's getting easier to spot. And sufferers can hope for a brighter future. Now, we have seen in this study that man does have a solution to stress, anxiety, and depression. That it has a multitude of solutions, and some are in this article, um, everywhere from such things as yoga, relaxation, uh, that type of therapy, massage, music, therapy, that type of thing, to drugs, to psychoanalysis, uh, on and on and on. The world does have a solution, but so does God. The article starts off <clears throat> by talking about Brian, B-R-I-A-N-N-E, Brian, um, her last name, uh, Camalera, had it all. Brian, had it all. Two involved parents, meaning involved with her, a caring older brother, and a comfortable home near Boston. But that didn't stop the overwhelming sense of hopelessness that developed, that enveloped her in the ninth grade. It was like a cloud that followed me everywhere. I couldn't get away from it. Brian started drinking and experimenting with drugs. One Sunday, she was caught shoplifting at a local store. Could have been in church. <laughs> uh, more ways than one. Uh, more reason than one. However, not all churches have any kind of a solution, as we're going to see. Uh, one Sunday, she was caught shoplifting at a local store, and her mother, Linda, drove her home uh, in what Brian describes as a piercing silence. With the clouds in her head <clears throat> so dark, she believed she would never see light again. And I'm going to talk about this darkness uh, tonight in our study. She thought she'd never see a light again. And that's the way many feel, adult or young. Brian went straight for the bathroom. She'd just been brought home from stealing. She went straight to the bathroom swallowed every Tylenol and Advil she could find. A total of 74 pills. I could never do that. I hate taking vitamin C in a tablet, but uh, 
doesn't mean that there aren't other ways of doing it as kids are finding. But anyway, she took 74 pills. She was only 14 years of age when this happened. She wanted to die. A few hours later, her mother Linda found her daughter vomiting <clears throat> all over the floor. Brian was rushed to the hospital where she convinced psychiatrists and even herself that it had been a one-time impulse. I'm going to go over here and read this. Anyway, she convinced herself that it was a one-time impulse. Um, the psychiatrist urged her parents to keep the episode a secret to avoid any stigma. My aunt's father, Alan, shudders when he remembers that advice. Mental illness is a closet problem in this country, and it's got to come out, he says. With a stick, now this is what this girl is going through, but listen to her environment. With a schizophrenic brother and a cousin who committed suicide, Alan thinks he should have known better. Instead, Brian's cloud was just darker. After another uh, aborted suicide attempt a few months later, she finally ended up at McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts, one of the best mental health facilities in the country. Now, after three years of therapy and antidepressant medication, Brian, 19, thinks she's on the right track, or on track. She's a sophomore at James Madison University. Brian is one of the lucky ones. Most of the nearly three million adolescents struggling with depression never get the help they need because of prejudice against mental illness. Inadequate mental health, they, they do not get the help they need, one, because of prejudice about mental illness, inadequate mental health resources, and widespread ignorance about how emotional problems can wreck young lives. The National Institute of Mental Health estimates that 8% of adolescents and 2% of children, some as young as four, have symptoms of depression. Scientists also say that early onset of depression in children and teenagers has become increasingly common. Some even use the word epidemic. No one knows whether <clears throat> there are actually more depressed kids today or just greater awareness of the problem. But some researchers think that the stress of high uh, divorce rate Rising academic expectations, social pressures may be pushing more kids over the edge. And I'm going to stop here a moment. Uh, why is this happening with all these kids? I like the things that this man is saying. Uh, I don't agree with the total picture here. I think there's a lot more. But note what he says, though. <clears throat> he says uh, the stress of the high divorce rate. Mm, so many Americans have developed the idea that the solution to a marital problem is divorce. Just end it. Um, rather than, and they, they look at the alternative as just living together miserable like our parents did. No, you don't want to do that either, but there is a, another alternative for Christians. I'm talking about Christians. That's what our whole study is for, is for the Christian. Um, people don't realize the effect of divorce on children. Uh, they can be told just like we can tell people about things in the Bible. And, all right, I understand it academically, but I do not understand it experientially. And even where I do, what I want is still more important than what it may do to my children. I'm not criticizing anyone that has gotten a divorce. Please understand that if you're listening to tape. This is not an anti-you type of deal. I would hope that you would want me to tell people this, especially unmarried people, before they get married. I'm always interested in people who drive by my house for counseling on the way to the courthouse. Not quite that dramatic, but that's the idea. Drive by on the way to the courthouse like I'm going to wave some magic wand and make it all well. 
Uh, it is, doesn't work that way. Um, rising academic expectations. In other words, performance. And uh, the first one is the, 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 the stripping from the child love. And, and putting playing parents against parents. And parents do that. And uh, Christian parents do that. Even with bona fide reasons of divorce, fathers will turn their children against the mother. The mother will turn the children against the father. It, it is ripping the country. Hank Williams sang an old song a long time ago that that little girl, from the voice of the little girl, that, that cause he was, she wasn't even allowed to mention her father's name, that he, he caused the whole family to be disgraced. And that's what parents do. How, how's a child supposed to handle that with, with a person they are, we could almost say created, to love and to need? And one person is making them sound like they are the worst person on earth. And these are Christians that do this. And they'll go to church. These same Christians that run down their children to run down to their children, their or their mother or their father, will sit in church so arrogantly pious, not even realizing the sins, the damage that they're doing as they self righteously judge and malign the other parent. I don't want to get off on that. This is why though we're in distress, parents as well as children. Then it says rising academic expectations, performance, which was Satan's lie. You got to perform. Your self-worth is your performance, and uh, it's the, not only the uh, academic as far as making the grades, but your performance in the school, in athletics, and in, in uh, extracurricular things. So much pressure in America. Social pressure—that's that type of thing. And then, of course, you and I both know the spiritual. Just not there. Just not there. And why wouldn't a person sitting in the pew think that, that divorce and, that divorce is the solution? When how many preachers? And I'm just using a current event. We could go all the way through you American history. When so many preachers got up and wanted uh, the president to be impeached, they want politicians to be thrown out. They want this thrown out. That. That's the way you, that, what you're teaching without saying it. You're telling people the way to solve your problem is get rid of it. That's what you're teaching. So, you take a woman sitting and listening to all that, or a man sitting there listening to all of that, not in the sense that this is what you do, but seeing how you solve problems, that's how we learn. And so now I've got a marital problem, well, I'll just get rid of it. Just like we were a president, I'll just get rid of you, and that solves the problem. Preachers are teaching how, that we should divorce. Without saying it. Oh, no, no, I don't do that. Yes, you do. And you're teaching people what is a Christian thing to do, then you're teaching how to handle it. So we have the performance of Satan's lie in, in this thing. Um, <clears throat> then he goes on to say this is a large, this is a huge change from a decade ago when many doctors considered depression strictly an adult disease. It's not a disease, people. It's in the soul, and that's what we're studying. We can call it a disease, then it can make uh, drugs and uh, all of that the right thing to do. And Christians do that, because they don't want to turn to just living by faith. God is not big enough to solve this problem. We need drugs. Now, let me quickly add for my critics. I am not saying there are not cases where drugs are needed. I'm not qualified to say that. I would be a fool. I would be very foolish. And if I were to say that, I wouldn't listen to anything else that I had to say on this subject. If somebody says that, that would be foolish. But I am saying too many Christians quickly run to drugs, psychotherapy, psychologists, counseling, because it's easier than just trusting God. People, it's much easier to pop a pill than to walk by faith. Face the facts. That's much easier. You pop the pill, it's immediately deadened. It's immediately deadened your brain, your emotion. So, so it's, you're handling it. No, you're not. No, you're not. I heard one, one well-known preacher, and, he, and, I, and I liked what he said. He said, people don't have alcoholic problems. They have problems in their soul. They have problems in their relationship with God. They have problems in their relationship with faith. And I'm sorry. I'm in that school. 
That's where I stand. I'm not saying there are not cases. I'm not qualified to say that. But I am qualified by the authority of this book that God does have the solution for most Christians. But they don't want to walk by faith. They don't want to just trust Him. Continuing. <clears throat> but scientists now believe that if this behavior is chronic, it may signal serious problems. New brain research is also uh, beginning to explain why teenagers may be particularly vulnerable to uh, mood disorders. Psychiatrists who treat the uh, adolescents who say parents should seek help if they notice a troubling change in eating, uh, sleeping, grades, social life uh, that lasts more than a few weeks. And public awareness of the need for help does seem to be increasing. And then it goes on with the human ideals and, and, and some good ideas in that respect. Some of the main headline things. Here is Arian uh, Jasmus. He's 17. Depression and anorexia were twin demons. And we understand how they're using the word demons. Uh, until she finally hit bottom the summer after her sophomore year in high school and had to be hospitalized because she had become suicidal and delusional. I, it was a slow, weird descendant into madness. Now, on three different medications, she feels reborn and ready for college. Certainly, it's quick. Doesn't mean that the problem is solved in any respect. Uh, Jonathan, he's 18. He has just about every risk factor for depression. Both parents were crack addicts. His family was homeless. He himself was a drug dealer when he was barely in his teens. Then during a stint in jail, he finally received psychiatric treatment he needed. That's his little story. Um, one thing that was interesting, if you have become depressed, at, if you become depressed at 25, you have some coping skills. But at 11, there's a lot you need to learn. And I would say even later than just 11, there's a lot to, to learn and a lot to uh, deal with. Um, Let's see, this was another good section in, in all of this. Um, a healthy teen brain, uh, and they go through some descriptions and the studies here, and a couple of things are interesting to us. Um, this, this brain study continues. But one section of the brain, uh, what it does, it involves, it involves, involved in self-awareness. That's what we and I have been calling self-worth self-identification, and intelligence, this cable, cable of nerves keeps growing until the early 20s. So, as I told you when we studied Satan's life at the beginning, and we've seen throughout the study of Satan's life, that whether you shun it, laugh at it, or whatever, self-worth is something that God has created every human being to need. And we're going to go to different places to find our self-worth. Satan's lie is the fundamental uh, place to go for self-worth. That my self-worth is my performance plus others' opinion of me, especially certain other opinion of me. Um, and that's why parents can destroy a child. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're too this. You're too ugly. You'll never be anything. You're a loser. Preachers do this from the pulpit, call people losers. Uh, it's hold all of these things and you start developing this this uh, self-awareness, self uh, worth that we're dealing with. It says here, teens must navigate a series of developmental hurdles as they approach adulthood, dealing with self-awareness. Learning to separate from parents, which some um, many do not learn to do, and establishing their own identity. M multitude, I'm, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of how big this thing was. Multitude of young people never separate from the identity of their parents, and they're controlled by their parents, enslaved to their parents, and uh, afraid to adventure out, afraid to trust God and go out and be and do who and what they are in Christ. They are enslaved to this. They never get past this stage. It's a very difficult stage to get to go through, but they have to go through it, and many parents today will not allow their children to do that because they control them so much 
telling them they're losers, telling them they're never adequate, you never perform well enough, you never made enough grades, you never did this, you never did that, and so the child, I'll never, I'll never be able to please mom and dad and spend their whole adult life trying to do that. And uh, others do it in a rebellious way, which is uh, bad in, its, in, its, in the way that it is handled. Just even with the truth of some of the things that we have studied already and are in the midst of studying. Um, horning in, uh, impersonal skills and forming a supportive social network is part of what the brain establishes us to do. But if we're living under these fortifications that we're studying in Corinthians now, this is when you start building them. The fortifications that we're talking about are not fortifications that are built over a short period of time. They're built all the way back to all of this. You start building the fortifications that Paul's talking about in Second Corinthians 10 at a very early stage. You start developing these fortifications. And it's going to take some time, as we'll see, to bring down these fortifications established in our soul. Um, and then there's the adjusting to uh, the changes of puberty that, that are affected, uh, that are come by one area of the brain. Uh, another area of sex hormones released during puberty uh, help explain the intensity of teen emotions and may spark more serious mood disorders. Uh, proper uh, sexual teaching orientation, uh, very big, uh, but it stands very close to self-worth. Many are the young girls who involve in, in teenage marital, or, excuse me, sexual activity. It's because they're trying to find someone that'll love them. Because they're not getting this at home. They're getting run down. And they can never please anybody, so they want to please this, this boy that, that they're with. Uh, he's trying to experiment and understand. I'm not going to come down on him either. Uh, uh, the, 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 this whole thing that's going on with, with inside of all of us, with these fortresses, People first remember the flesh nature that we've been studying. The flesh nature is continually being corrupted, deceitful above all else, incurably wounded, all these things. And we're trying to handle all of this with secular human problems. It's not going to be done. Um, they list the various types of depression, uh, which we have not done and are not going to do. This is not a medical study. It's a spiritual study. Um, they give a lot of uh, symptoms uh, to be overlooked. Vague physical complaints such as headaches, uh, frequent absences from school, or drug uh, or drop in grades, bouts of shouting or crying, reckless behavior. Reckless behavior, but my mother would have had us all on that one. Okay, reckless behavior, but I think we know what they're talking about. Extreme uh, sensitivity to rejection or failure, uh, loss of interest in friends. And these, these kinds of things, the things that they're dealing with. Um, but the main article, the main flow of this, of this article is dealing with clinical and modern solutions. Um, there's, here's Hannah. Uh, Hannah is 21. In 1993, when she found out she had lupus, uh, she spiraled into a depression that went far beyond despair over chronic illness. In her journal, she wrote, I haven't been truly happy since I can't remember at all. I'm dead. Now, after therapy, uh, she's turning that, uh, she's uh, turning that uh, journal into a book to help other teenagers and try to explain all these things. No one's found what you and I know to be the solution. And that's why I'm kind of going through all of this stuff. But the problem is there, absolutely. Not to be denied. It's how we're going to deal with this. Um, so then they, they give a long deal on the doctors and how the doctors have drugs and uh, uh, psychotherapy and all these kinds of things that uh, they want these kids to do. You can read the article. Uh, it's hard for parents to understand. There's another uh, main thing here. A founder and doctor and director of the New York University Child Study Center, <clears throat> Dr. Harold uh, Kopperwitz, has been first has seen firsthand the pain that depression brings to families. Uh, his new book, More Than uh, Moody, uh, recognizing and treating adolescent depression, describes current 
therapeutic approaches and new research, which he discusses with uh, Newsweek's uh, editor here, writer here. Uh, how does depression manifest uh, itself different, differently in teens and adults? Depressed teens are more reactive to the environment than depressed adults. In addiction, they are uh, irritable. They act irritable. In classical depression, you are depressed all or almost all of the time. Depressed teens' moods are much more changeable. <clears throat> if an adult male gets depressed and you take him to a party, he is still depressed. In fact, he may depress others at the party. Uh, a teenager, a teenage boy who is depressed and gets taken to a party might brighten, uh, might actually want to have sex. If pursued, he might enjoy himself. But if he goes home alone, he is likely to become very depressed again. Uh, going, going home. Okay. Um, let's see. These mood changes are very hard for parents to understand. Most teenagers are moody. When should uh, parents start to worry? Parents have to know their children. And very few parents know their children. Very few parents. Well, it just goes along with these kind of uh, solutions and kind of things. Some of it very helpful. Um, and um, it's um, it would be well, my, well advised for parents to uh, get a hold, if they can, of this edition and read it. There's a lot of lacking. In fact, what you and I know to be the main thing lacking is lacking, and that's uh, God's solution to all of this. But man has his solution, and Christians love it. And the reason Christians love this, this uh, pills and drugs is quick. You do not have to learn to walk by faith. And you just take the kids and have to deal with it. You don't have to deal with it. That's, that's why a lot of times parents uh, will say, and a husband will say, or a wife will say, we don't have a family problem. Because if I say that and believe it, if I say we don't have a problem in our marriage, then I don't have to do anything. If I hear my words saying, well, we have a problem, that means i got to do something about it. But if I can just say, hey, we're okay. Hey, we, we you know, we're, we don't, we have a fight. Everybody does. But we're okay. My child's okay. That's, you know, they're a little problem, just girls, that teenage stuff, but everything's okay. Why do that? Because they don't have to deal with it. If I admit my teenager, my adolescent, has some problems, then I've got to deal with it. And most people don't want to deal with it. And we don't want to deal with our own. That's why we're, so many Christians are in denial about their own stress, anxiety, and depression. I don't know how to deal with it. It's weakness. Uh, why does an alcoholic not want to admit that they're alcoholic? Well, the, the, the first thing, not one, the first thing an alcoholic must do, as almost every human being knows, is to acknowledge I'm an alcoholic. Got to acknowledge that. Why won't they do that? Because that would mean I'm a weak person. I'm dependent on some substance. And we're not going to admit that. We're in denial about that. And uh, we've got the flesh has this, since it's, since it's continually being corrupted, it wants to fight that. So it's in denial. The first thing we want to do is just get to understand the flesh nature. And it really help us. And our identity, our self-worth, is not in our flesh nature. How much better to, to acknowledge these things and go to God's solution, to learn to trust Him. Yes, people, it's tough. Well, it's what the Bible's about. But the, uh, many people today would have written David off as just a, a womanizer and uh, never can be used of God. And not only that, a lot of things they would have been calling David. Judah, the same thing. You know, these people are dealing in spiritual problems. Christians don't want to acknowledge these things. They don't want to understand. God has a solution. The world solution is drugs. The world solution is to deal with us. Now listen, you know, okay, listen to this. The world wants to deal with people as evolutionary products. We are this animal. And we study the brain of this animal. And we learn what to do with different things in the brain and all this. It's just a process of evolution. And there is no spiritual phenomenon really going on. There's no faith involved. 
And uh, what I, I know people who say, oh, well, if you just take the drugs, then you can learn Bible doctrine. People, Bible doctrine is not the solution. Knowledge makes us arrogant. The solution is walking by faith in the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to change our lives and our souls from within. And one of the things he will do, of course, is lead us to the love of Scripture. But it's not just being a matter that I can emotionally sit down and think, because I'm taking this drug, it's going to solve my problems. Battle is faith, Paul says. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter 10. It hurts us when our children have problems and we try to deny it, we try to write it off because we take it personally. Don't do that. We don't, don't do that. We hate to, to examine our own selves spiritually. When we are, when we are victims of stress, anxiety, and depression, it cannot be me. It can't be me. That's why it's gotta be my husband, my wife, the government circumstances. How poor I am. How nobody likes me. And all of the things that are going on that we like to say that's the depression. No people, we choose to be depressed. We choose to be depressed. We choose to be, have anxiety and to be stressed. To be oppressed in our soul. We choose it. It's a choice. And we've dealt with that so much now. Why do we choose the, to deny all that? Because I, I, I don't want to admit that it's, that I'm, that I'm responsible here. No, it's got to be something outside of me. No, it's inside of us. And the most wonderful thing I've tried to show you, uh, those that suffer stress, anxiety, and depression is, this is good news. That it is a choice is good news. If it is not a choice, if it is involuntary, then, yeah, we're going to need something else. We're, we do have a major problem, and boy, we, it's like, if I have, if, if I go out and break my arm, see, that's not, that's not something that we can say, oh, well, I really didn't, and it, 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 it's uh, uh, mental, it's not. No, it's real. It's, it's a physical thing. And that's what I would like to think about the stress, anxiety, and depression, that no, 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 it's not voluntary, it's involuntary. Like my broken arm is involuntary, that my arm is, is broken. Well, what you've got to realize is the good news about stress, anxiety, and depression being voluntary is that now we know we can go to God. Now we know that we can go to His solution of trusting Him. Open up the scriptures instead of a drug bottle. Open up the scriptures instead of psychoanalysis and therapy and all this other stuff to settle down in my soul and trust Him. Trust Him. What does the future hold for me? I'm no good. I'm unworthy. These teenagers, I'm not worthy. I can't please my mother. I can't please my father. And now after uh, X number of sexual involvements, I found out I can't even please uh, other boys. And I can't, I can't please boys. I can't please girls. I can't do this. It's never enough. And keep searching and becoming, and each time becoming more and more depressed. With each sexual encounter, with each time, time trying to do more and more for mom and dad, to impress somebody, the preacher, anybody, and the failure, the more depressing. Because you're trying to solve the depression by doing more. You're under Satan's lie. How wonderful it is to allow the Holy Spirit to turn on the light in our soul and start tearing down these fortresses. Start tearing down these things that are in our soul that have been making us stressed out and depressed. Look at chapter 10 of Second Corinthians. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, that's where we live. We live in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. Now verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare. Now, first of all, you realize we're in a war. Got to realize we are in a spiritual war. But we're not going to go to the flesh. We're not going to go to human wisdom. We're not going to go to human solutions. We're not going to do that. Because they're not where the war is. When our warfare, weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful. This is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Study this, excuse me, with Galatians 3. For what? The destruction of fortresses. Where are these strongholds? Strongholds are in your soul. You've been building them from your, before adolescence. You've been building them all along. You started building them based on Satan's lie. You build them in your relationship with your parents or whoever your guardian was. We'll just use parents as a guardianship word. Your parents trying to please them, trying to earn their love, earn their approbation. All these kinds of things going on. 
And then look what it says. What are these sources? We're going to destroy uh, for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying, and we've taken a look at both the different words for destruction of fortresses and destroying, speculations, and every lofty thing. Every lofty thing is every lofty thought, a thought pattern that is placed above the true knowledge of God, up against the knowledge of God. So what happens is there is a true knowledge of God, but what happens when you think that your self-worth is your performance and based on Satan's lie, you have put that above what God says about you. God says who you are in Christ, but I don't believe that. I believe I'm this horrible, inadequate loser. But God says no. God says you're holy, righteous. I don't feel it. I don't know. It's like a girl, and usually here's a girl, it's like a girl with anorexia. She looks in the mirror, and the poor girl weighs about 90 pounds, but when she looks in the mirror, she sees this horrible, overweight person, and nobody's going to convince her differently. Christians look at themselves, and I'm just this horrible loser. My parents have made sure I know that, and, and of course, my parents wouldn't lie to me, so I must be a loser. I must be inadequate to go out into the world. I must be inadequate to take on some field or profession and do this and do that because my parents wouldn't lie to me. They, they, they care. So I must really be inadequate. And they start building these fortresses built based upon Satan's lie. Well, look what happens. The Holy Spirit can destroy them. Not drugs. Not world solutions. Again, I'm going to repeat because I, I don't want to get a lot of calls. I know there are cases where drugs are involved that are needed. I'm not foolish in that realm. I'm saying that too many Christians are too quick. Just like they run to divorce, they run to drugs. They run to those human solutions that are out there. They're quick, they're sweet, they're nice. How nice it is not to have to work things out with my husband and my wife. How nice it is that I don't have to walk by faith and, and, and put into a trusting of God to pour in spiritual love and allow Him to cause this marriage to work. How easy it is when it's just over. I don't have to deal with it anymore. I don't have to deal with him anymore. I don't have to deal with him anymore. I don't have to deal with all of his, all of his video sequences and his controlling factors and his this and his that. I don't have to deal with all of her pettiness and all of her attacking and all of her emotional patterns and all of this and her mother and her father and her everything else. I don't have to deal with it. I'm just divorced and it's over! That's where Christians today live. Welcome back there. Take time what the whole damage of the evil of lordship salvation. Well, all of a sudden, everything is wonderful and peaceful to you and God and He's Lord of your life. No, it's not. It takes time. That's why Paul cried out, as a believer, O wretched man that I am. Who's going to rescue me from this? Drugs? Psychotherapy? Psychoanalysis? The wisdom of man? Or does God have a solution? In chapter 8 of Romans, we have a solution. The Holy Spirit. What well, by the Spirit? Trusting. What are the fruit of the Spirit, people? What are the fruit of the Spirit? Peace. Peace. What are these kids looking for? What are people with stress, anxiety, and depression looking for? Peace. The Bible tells you the solution. The Holy Spirit putting peace in your soul. How do you get that, though? Circumstances? No. You trust Him. Just as you trusted Jesus Christ to give you His work, which was eternal salvation, we trust the Holy Spirit to give us His work. Peace. Things that He gives are the opposite of stress, anxiety, and depression. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. I didn't plan on this. Maybe we'll have to do it before we do it. We've got a couple of things to cover yet. I was thinking about closing this out, but this, the Holy Spirit just beat me that we got some major things yet to cover. <clears throat> do you realize one thing we've not done? How many times have I mentioned the word and the phrase, who you are in Christ? Have, have we even studied it? Have we looked at it? No. A lot of Christians know who they are in Christ. A lot of Christians don't. So we got to look at that. That's that's bad. How could I end this series without doing that? Since I've been using that phrase since day one. Please look at Galatians chapter 5. Think about stress. Think about anxiety. Think about depression. Think about a life that is oppressed. A teenager, an adolescent, a young married person, a young unmarried person, adults, married, single, whatever, old age, whatever's going on. Think about this. Here's what the Bible says 
the Holy Spirit will give you. And He just gives it freely. Gives it freely. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. Flowing through you. People these teenagers don't feel loved or loving. Both. They don't feel like they're not deserving to be loved and they don't know how to love. Many adults are not deserving to be loved. They don't know how to love. That's the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. People, when you're experiencing this love, depression, stress, these things start setting aside into the shadows of your life. Slowly. That's why Paul calls it the hope of righteousness. It's not something you're going to get, boom, sir. Something you're going to get is you're totally freed and liberated of these things. So there's just Go with the first one. Then look at what he says in verse 22. Peace. Oh, joy. Joy. What do I read when one of these kids? I'll never be happy again. I'll never be happy again! Yes, you can, hon. I can say I can be happy again. But it's not found in sexual, having sexual activity with a man, with another kid. It's not in making good grades. It's not in performance. And it's not in who what people think about you. It's just by simply trusting God, the Holy Spirit, and your poor and joy. It means you can be happy when you have no reason to be happy. And by that I mean the circumstances in your life haven't changed. You still have the relative that committed suicide. You still have the event that happened in your life that you were abused. You still have this. You still have that. You still have... But you see, people, it is not what happens to you in your life. It's your interpretation of those things how you deal with them in your soul. And Satan builds up these big strongholds in our soul and the flesh builds up these strongholds in our soul and the world builds up these strongholds in our soul that keep you in bondage. What does he offer you? Peace. What kind of price? Free. Just slowly, one day, it may just be a moment, 60 seconds. But you know what? I'm going to tell you something, those of you that are critics of that. You ask anybody who's... Suffering from stress and depression. Well, I give, I give a lot for one minute. I some real happiness and peace. Okay. And tomorrow, we'll put together two full minutes. In about a month, we'll put together five straight minutes of walking in the Spirit. We're going to experience love, joy, peace. Think about peace for a moment. I don't know how to think about it in the past, but think about it now for my studies. I'm distressed. I'm oppressed. I'm depressed about life. I'm depressed about all these things. Here's peace. Peace in your soul. Stay that turmoil and that twisting, that darkness. Here's light. I can now see the room, so there's a peace. People, what's the thing about being blind or being in total darkness? I can't see. Even in my own, even in my own bedroom, I know something's going on. I know somebody's moving in this part of my house, or I think they are, or outside in the yard. I can't see anything except darkness that gives us fear. I'm going to turn on the light. I'm going to let the Spirit turn on the light. And you can see, I have nothing to fear. I can walk around here, get around there. I don't have to feel my way. Walk by the light of the Holy Spirit. Look what else is good. Think about these for a person that has stress. We might have to look at this in this series. I had planned on it. Um... First of all, love, which is totally lacking, joy, peace, patience. You ever dealt with somebody who's stressed, oppressed, anxiety, no patience, nervous. That's why they have anxiety. How am I going to go? Well, you can, talk, you can take a pill. That'll, that'll help anxiety. That'll help in patience. It will. It will. I promise you. It's in dead in your bone. Well, you'll have patience. But that's not the patience that you want. We don't want a manipulation. We want power. Look what it says. This comes from the Holy Spirit. The third member of the Godhead can give you patience. Patience. A lot of people suffer stress today because of impatience. Impatience driving. Impatient with our children, impatient with husband, wife, others. They're not doing what we want them to do and they're not doing it fast enough. So they become impatient. You want patience? You can go take a tablet. 
You can go take a couple of uh, courses, or you can learn to walk by faith in the Holy Spirit and develop a relationship with God that is real and let Him pour in patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness to God, faithfulness to walking, gentleness, self-control. These kinds of things are the very things that a stressed person, adolescent, teenager, adult, is looking for. Where are you going to find it? Here's a cure, people. Here's a cure. Here's a solution. Let the Holy Spirit do it. And one of the ways that he does this in our study is that he does it by tearing down, first of all, the defenses of Satan, the defenses of depression. Now, what do I mean by defenses? I mean the defense that protects while you get depression and anxiety and frustration and, and all of these type of things. Get under stress. Well, what we're going to do is we have to tear down the defenses of these things. Tear them down so that he can turn on the light and pour in abundantly his fruit. So that's why we're talking in this section. Tearing down the defenses. Tearing or the strongholds. Destroying. Two different words. Yeah, let's go back now to uh, 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Look what we're going to do in this. Two different words, but the point that I want to show you is without getting back into the various words and just seeing what they mean. For the destruction of the forces, we are destroying speculations in every lofty thing. That has to be done, people. See what drugs do? Psychotherapy, all these things. They don't do this. Still got it. The father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud said, you never cured. I think that's probably the only wise thing Sigmund Freud ever said. Because what Sigmund Freud saw in saying that statement, he was looking at the flesh. Is the flesh self ever cured? No. Is the flesh self ever made better? No. So Sigmund Freud makes this dramatic statement, you're never free. You're never going to be cured, was his word. He didn't mean that you're just going to have to keep you paying me more money. That would be our joke about it. That isn't what he meant. He just means you're always going to have this problem. We are not solving the problem. We can't. But the Bible says God can and will. to do it free. Freely, graciously. With you. If you're trusting if you walk by faith in the Spirit, He will destroy. He will destroy. He will bring these fortresses down. Now, why do we want to bring them down, people? Think of what they are. Think of what a fortress is. A fortress is that in which whoever is inside of the fortress is secure. So we have a fortress, and whatever is inside of this fortress in our soul is secure because of this fortress. So Satan's lie is very secure in the fortress in our soul. All the things we've been studying are very secure and coming up as that seven-headed dragon. Coming up as stress, anxiety, and depression, they're very secure inside of us. And the way we're going to get them out is not drown them with alcohol, and not pollute them with drugs, and not uh, feed on them with psychoanalysis and counseling and all that kind of stuff. We're going to allow the Spirit of the living God to go inside and tear these fortresses down. That's what we're going to allow to do. But it's tough to walk by faith. I don't care if you're not experiencing stress, anxiety, and depression. You know that's the battle. It is tough. That's the toughest thing to do. It's easy to come to class if that's all you do and learn Bible doctrine. It's easy just to live out of try to live a life of pure, be a pure person and not commit horrible sins. All these things are easy. But to walk by faith every waking moment just trust in God. That's the battle. That's the battle. But the more we learn to do that, we allow Satan to start tearing down these fortresses, these strongholds. Now it says, speculations and every lofty thing. Now last week was one of the most important classes in this series that we've done. And you might want to listen to that again if you're self-experiencing stress, anxiety, and depression, listen to the tape. I want to listen to that one again. It was, very, it was short, intentionally. Didn't take a long time for us to do last week. But didn't take up nearly our full time. I did that on purpose. 
and that tape to be short because that tape is important. And the experience to build up the fortresses in your soul and in your mind, they destroy your spiritual life. They have to be torn down. And what did we see last week? They actually hinder you walking by faith. Why is it so difficult for Christians, say you, if you're in this year, why is it so difficult for me to stay on FM, the faith mindset, and so easy to go back to AM, the identity mindset? Why is it so difficult to walk by faith? It sounds so simple, just, just trusting. How much simpler can that sound? And why can't I do that? It's just so simple. Example, you, you would think, simple things are not easy. Simple things are not easy. It's simple, but not easy. You would think, if you and I just sat here and talked about a professional male who's been doing something for, let's just for fun say, the last five or six years of his life, high school and college, and he gets into the pros, we could stay in college if we wanted to, and yet a pro, the most difficult thing for a receiver to do is to run the pattern correctly. And we sit in our mind and go, I don't understand. Ten yards out, seat to the left, seat to the right, hook, do this. You just do that. They can't do it. They don't do it. They're not where they belong in plays. And we sit there with, you're paid millions of dollars and you can't run a route or the route here? People, simple things are not easy. He was saying, how simple. Listen, do you really think that people who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, simple faith in Jesus Christ, and you have eternal life, do you really think that people say, that say no to that want to go to hell? No, I want to burn all my life. I'm going to try to offer God my work. No. I don't want to go to hell. But it just can't be that easy. It can't be that simple. It's got to be more than that. So I'm going to do what my church tells me to do. I'm going to do what my denomination tells me to do. I'm going to have to walk an aisle. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do that. But when you of us make it through that, okay, it's the faith. I trust him. I got it. But now we try to live the Christian life. No, it can't be just by faith. I cannot be restored from my sins by simple faith. I've either got to confess. I've got to feel sorry. I've got to promise God I'll never do it again. I've got to do something. It cannot be. Just trust him. Just trust the Spirit. And he revives experientially, just as Christ did by simple faith, and saved you forever. Faith is too simple. Can faith solve stress, anxiety, and depression? No. You just can't do it. Uh, my, my problem is too deep. I need a long word for my problem. And I need the very best doctor for my problem. And I need drugs. And I need alcohol. And I need this. And I need that. It's just too easy. I, I, I'm, I, I'm much more complex than that. You cannot solve this problem by simple faith, and I've had Christians tell me that. Their God is not big enough that if you just trust Him, He'll do this. The God that I read in this Bible, people, the God that I know in this Bible, and the studies that have done in this study of stress, anxiety, and depression, God can solve it. Just like He solved your eternal life problem. Just like He solved your experience problem. He can solve this one if we just trust Him. But just like many unbelievers, they won't do it. And many believers, they don't want to trust Him either. And now people with stress and anxiety and depression don't want to just trust Him. It's the view of God, people. I'm sorry. It's not the view of your own problem. It's not the view of how big and severe your problem is. It's not the view of what happened to you when you were raped as a little boy and a little girl. It's not the view of how you've been always put aside and you're a loser and you've never done this and no one loves you and all these type of things. That's not, you're looking at the wrong place. Your problem is the view of God. That's a problem. Not what happened to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry because I'm, t- I'm introducing you to where to go for the solution. Get your eyes off yourself and get your eyes on God. Is God, think for a moment. Is my view of God, is my God big enough to solve the problem of my soul if I just trust Him? Question number two. Let's say I say, yes, I think it's big enough. Will my God, will my God solve my problem of stress, anxiety, and depression? Will my God tear down these fortresses that are in my soul if I just trust Him? 
You don't have to be with stress people. It's a whole dealing with stress and God in the present. I'm sorry and I'm happy for you. It's that simple. So, first of all, make up your mind about God. Don't make up your mind about your stress and God in the present, what's causing it, all these kinds of things, what happened to you, how people treat you and treated you, and all these things. What's your view of God? Can I just trust Him? Close in the word of God. Heavenly Father, boy, our society has really gotten damaged as we've moved more and more and more away from an understanding and a, at least an acknowledgement of you. And so little of the world will even put the two things together. We live in a society today, Father, and, and even nothing like the one I grew up in when I was in high school many years ago. The young people today, adolescents today, experiencing such stress, anxiety, depression, horror stories. So depressing. It's depressing to hear the depressing stories, Father. How wonderful it is to know you have given to us a solution. You have given to us. Inside of us, a power source that can tear these fortresses down if we will let you. And so in closing, Father, I pray that this case will get into the hands of a few people who will not be blinded to the simplicity that you offer for our eternal salvation, for our experiential sanctification, and for our problems of stress and depression. What an amazing God you are. And you can do it without changing our circumstances, without changing our finances, without changing our marriage. We don't have to run and get a divorce. We just simply need to rest and trust in you. Thank you, Father, for taking us on this journey. As the problem increases, the awareness of your solution needs to increase right along with the solutions that the world has. And I pray that you use these tapes in this series for that purpose. That people know there is another solution other than drugs and alcohol and human solutions and human wisdom. You have one. This will but come to you. We praise you, Father, and your son's precious name. Amen.